I don't think I've ever heard that song, Micah, but I enjoyed the words and I appreciate you introducing a new song to us. If you've got your Bible this morning, I'd invite you to take and turn with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter number uh, 2, and we're going to read through chapter number 3. So and when you found your place in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, we're going to begin reading in verse number 17 this morning, and we're going to carry through chapter number 3. When you found your place this morning, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, I'd invite you to please stand with me as we read God's Word. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse number 17. The Bible says this, For since we were torn away from you, brothers, for a short time, in person, not in heart, we endeavored the more eagerly and with great desire to see you face to face. Because we wanted to come to you, I, Paul, again and again. But Satan hindered us. For what is our hope or joy or crown of boasting before our Lord Jesus at His coming? Is it not you? For you are our glory and joy. Now we're starting chapter number 3, verse number 1. The Bible says this, Therefore, when we could bear it no longer, we were willing to be left behind to offer it to others. And we sent Timothy, our brother and God's co-worker in the gospel of Christ, to establish and exhort you in the faith, that no one be moved by for you yourselves know that we are destined for this. Verse number 4. For when we were with you, we kept telling you beforehand that we were to suffer affliction, just as it has come to pass and just as you know. For this reason, when I could bear it no longer, I sent to learn about your faith. For fear that somehow the tempter had tempted you and our labor would be in vain. But now that Timothy has come to us from you, he has brought us the good news of your faith and love and reported that you always remember us kindly and long to see us as we long to see you. Verse 7. For this reason, brothers, in all our distress and affliction, we have been comforted about you through your faith. For now we live if you are standing fast in the Lord. For what thanksgiving can we return to God for you for all the joy that we feel for your sake before our God? As we pray most earnestly day and night, that we may see you face to face and supply what is in your faith. Now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus direct our way to you. And may the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all, as we do for you, so that he may establish your hearts blameless and for our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints. Let's go to the Lord and ask for his favor now. Lord, thank you again for allowing us to be able to come out this morning and uh, one, to, to have the chance to fellowship with other believers, people who also has the same desire. They're all plowing in the same direction. Lord, thank you for brothers and sisters in Christ that we can come together and uh, Lord, we're not left alone. You've given us other people to live life with in community and Lord, we thank you for that this morning. Uh, Lord, we thank you for the chance to read your word and, and to learn more about you and, and your standard and what you desire in our lives. And Lord, I pray just in a very simple way, Lord, that you'd speak through your word this morning, that uh, nothing would hinder us from listening or, or draw our attention away. Lord, I pray uh, for Brother Easton, who at this very same time is delivering your word in, in a different location. Lord, I pray that you would help us to be mouthpieces, that, to be messengers of, of what we've studied and I pray, Lord, again, that you would, again, use your word uh, to challenge hearts and to show us ways that we've gone wayward. And, uh, Lord, help us this morning as we see what sacrificial love looks like. We're going to see for the rest of the day, maybe as we watch television or uh, just live life, we're going to see the world putting forward this idea of love. But, but Lord, you, we ask, Lord, that you would challenge that worldly view of love and show us what true sacrificial love looks like. And, Lord, show and examine our hearts and, and show us ways in our own life that we're, we're not living sacrificially. Ways that we may be living selfishly and for ourselves and for our own desires and, and areas in which we're putting ourselves first. Lord, show us that and, and help us to change through the power of the Holy Spirit and, and help us to repent and turn to you for grace. Lord, help us now and uh, we'll give you all the glory for it. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Church family, you can be seated. 
uh, for years and years, I never really understood the love that a pastor has for the church that he serves at. I never really understood that growing up. For 16 years, I sat in a pew, much like what you guys are sitting in now, and I'd hear a pastor say, hey, I, I love you, but it never, really, it never really clicked for me. I heard him, and I understood, yeah, he loves us, but I never really understood how deep that love went. You see, time after time after time, my pastor, he's, he's a big guy. I mean, he looked like John Wayne. and I mean, he, just, he was a great pastor. This huge, manly man would stand up behind the pulpit, and with a tear streaming down his cheeks, he would look at us, and he would he'd point his finger, and he says, I love you. But he didn't just talk about love. He showed his church affection as well. As the congregation would trickle out of their pew to exit the church, uh, many times he would be standing at the back, and I'd be walking with my mom and dad and my two little sisters, and, and as we walked out of the back of the church, we'd go to shake his hand, and he'd always, he'd always pull us in. And there was no resisting that man. I mean, this guy was big. He'd pull us under his arm, and he'd hug on us. And I'd think that after he hugged my sisters, I, he wouldn't fool with me. But he would. He'd pull me into his side, and he'd say, I love you. And he meant it. You know, it's hard. And I never really understood just the love that a pastor has for his church until recently. A pastor should affectionately love the church and the people that he serves. This was the case for the Apostle Paul. And, and it's, it's really described in the passage that we just read. The Apostle Paul says time and time again, let me give you an example. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse number 8, the Apostle Paul talks about the church and he says, I was affectionately desirous of you because you have become very dear to us. And later on in Philippians chapter 1, verse number 8, says, I yearn for you all with affection of Christ Jesus. A true gospel-centered, Bible-believing pastor not only loves the church, he's affectionate towards the church. A great pastor knows the families within his church. He, he, he doesn't just know who, who comes on Sunday morning. He knows their family. He knows their names. He knows their children's names. He knows their interests. And he knows the struggles that they have. Not only that, he celebrates when God's working in the, in the life of that family. And he, when he sees spiritual growth, a good pastor encourages them and, and celebrates the change. A good pastor, a gospel-centered pastor, does tell the church that he loves them. And he does it often and frequently. A good pastor not only talks about loving the church, he, he prays for them. There's a pattern of prayer in his life where he's, he's praying for the individuals within the church and, and he's constantly reminding them of salvation and what that looks like and encouraging them. The reason why I mentioned to you what a good pastor looks like is because we have a display of this. It's been manifest through the Apostle Paul's life here in this passage. The Apostle Paul was a great pastor. He loved the church. He gave the church his heart and his affections. But things weren't easy. As the Apostle Paul's writing this letter to the church at Thessalonica, his love was being strained. You see, things weren't always easy for the church there at Thessalonica. If you were to go back to Acts chapter 17, you'd see along the way the Apostle Paul's teaching and he, things are going well with, within the church. People are growing. People are honestly following the Lord as disciples. And the Apostle Paul as a pastor is investing in them. And then they're going out and they're investing in other people. Discipleship's just, just reduplicating. It's, it's happening biblically. But along the way, there started in the community becoming this uprise. People started going against Paul's teaching. And, and eventually, some people in the community there at Thessalonica took some of the Christians into custody. There was a threat, a legitimate threat in the community to this church. Well, to make a long story short, in order to keep the peace, Paul, Silas, and Timothy had to leave town so that these other Christians wouldn't become hard. They wouldn't become harmed. Then look at the very first verse that we read, verse number 17. Paul loves them, but he has to leave unexpectedly. That's why the Apostle Paul says there in verse 17, 
But since we were torn away, the Apostle Paul loved him. He, he was investing in relationships, but he had to leave. And it, it literally broke his heart because he's having to leave these folks. So where did the Apostle Paul go? Where did he, where did he have to leave? He got run out of town. Where did he go? The first place that he went was a place called Berea. And later on, he would end up in a place called Athens. That's where he wrote this letter from. But all along the way, the Apostle Paul thought this was a premature having to leave. He hadn't got to invest all that he wanted to invest in with the people. He knew that persecution and tribulation and trouble was coming their way, and he was afraid they weren't going to stand fast. Eventually, Paul had had enough. He's worried. He loves these folks. And so notice what the Bible says in chapter uh, 3, verse number 1. The Bible says, Therefore, when we could bear it no longer, we were willing to be left behind at Athens alone. So what Paul has done here is he's had enough. He's, he's, he's tired of worrying about the church there at Thessalonica. He, he wants to see how they're doing because he loves them. So what we're going to see in these next few verses is the love, sacrificial love, of this pastor towards this church. Now, I know it's entirely possible this morning, as we talk on this subject, sacrificial love, you, you may have never been in a place of ministry where you've uh, held a place of leadership in the church, but the theme still applies to everyone within the sound of my voice. What does sacrificial love look like? You may be a husband here this morning, or looking to become a husband one day. You must biblically display sacrificial love within relationships in order for them to grow. If you want to see growth in any sort of relationship, it must display sacrificial love. And that's what's happening here in this, uh, in this passage. So notice first this morning, when we talk about sacrificial love, notice we see the sacrifice of sending. We see that here in, in verse number 1. Let's, let's read it again. The Bible says, therefore, when we could bear it no longer, we were willing to be left behind to Athens alone. So notice here, verse number one is describing to us, Paul, he was willing to sacrifice. He was willing to give up. Now, what is he going to give up? The Bible tells us in verse number two. It says, and we sent Timothy, our brother and God's co-worker in the gospel of Christ, to establish and to exhort you in the faith. So Paul... Because he loves someone, he was willing to sacrifice. He was willing to give up. Well, what is he giving up? He's giving up his co-worker in the gospel. The guy's name is Timothy. So again, picture in your mind's eye, here is Paul and Silas and Timothy. They, they've had to move on. But they're still thinking about this little country church back here. And so Paul, because he loves this little church, is willing to sacrifice ministry there in order to send back Timothy to care for them. So let's think, where's Paul at? He's in a place called Athens. Athens was, is one of really one of the oldest cities in all of the world. And this city was a, it was a big city. And because it was a big city, this is the same city that Socrates and, and all Aristotle, all these philosophies, all this line of thought come from. This is one of the most idol-worshipping cities in all the world during this time. People that put other things in the place of God. They worship other things besides God. That's what idolatry is. This is a very bad place. This is the same place in Acts chapter 17 where the Apostle Paul went and confronted the philosophers on Mars Hill. But the point is this. We're talking about sacrificial love. That's where Paul is at. He's willing to be left alone to be placed with a heavier burden on himself in order that he could love on someone else. It was all about sacrifice. He was willing to give up in order to love someone else. Now, can you imagine, just think in your mind's eye for just a second, can you imagine all of the, um, can you imagine the work that could have been done with Paul and Timothy there in Athens? I mean, they had a good thing going. But Paul was willing and able to give that up. Here's the point. It's tempting to not want to give up in order to love other people. Now, let me say this in a different light. The temptation is to, to preserve our own comfort instead 
of loving on other people. See, the Apostle Paul's willing to take a heavier load upon himself in order that he could love other people. So what does he do? He sends Timothy back to Thessalonica. But there's more to this sacrifice here. I want you guys to see this. Paul chose to take the load for the benefit of other people. Paul did hard things in order to love others. Think about this. Paul loved this church at Thessalonica. But instead of going himself to love on them, he sends somebody else. So again, he's displaying sacrificial love. Let me explain. Why couldn't Paul go back himself and check on the church? Look back in 1 Thessalonians 2, verse number uh, 18. He says, because we wanted to come to you, I, Paul, again and again, Paul wanted to go back and check on them, but the Bible says Satan hindered us. Why couldn't Paul go back and check on the church himself? Because Satan's hindering us. We don't know the exact reasons here, but again, Paul is giving up his rights in order to serve other people. Paul could have chosen what was best for him in the situation, but he doesn't. He didn't do that. He looked out for the interests of other people. You're saying, Brother Travis, I'm already distracted. What's going on? <laughs> Help me to connect the rubber with the road. What's taking place here in this passage? Here we have the Apostle Paul as a pastor who loves the church. But in every situation of true biblical sacrificial love, Giving of ourselves must take place. If you truly love someone else, you're going to sacrifice your own best interest for the benefit of other people. And that's exactly what the Apostle Paul does. He was willing to give up in order that others could benefit. He looked out for the interests of other people. You say, now how does this connect to me? Well, today's Valentine's Day, right? We're talking about true love. We're talking about true sacrificial love. True sacrificial love is not selfish. It doesn't seek its own way. It seeks the benefit of other people. The Apostle Paul displays this to us. He consistently chose the best for other people rather than for himself. He chose to give up certain joys that he might could experience so that the church at Thessalonica could, could enjoy those benefits. Paul loved these folks. He gave up his privileges to go check on the church by being sacrificial. Now, Paul wasn't just marked by sacrificial love this one time. Did you know his whole ministry and his life was marked by sacrificial love? He didn't just love the church at Thessalonica. He even showed love to the church at Philippi as well. Listen to what the Bible says in Philippians 2, verses 19 through 22. The Bible says, I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon, so that I too may be cheered by the news of you. For I have no one like him who will be genuinely concerned for your welfare. Listen to this. For they all seek their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. But you know Timothy's proven worth, how as a son with a father, he has served me in the gospel. So here's, here's the point. The mark of a healthy relationship the mark of a healthy marriage, the mark of a healthy church, the, the mark of a healthy uh, discipleship program, all of those things have one thing in common. It's sacrificial love. If you want a healthy marriage, then you have to have sacrificial love. You have to seek the interest of your spouse rather than yourself. If you want a healthy relationship within the church, within the fellowship, you have to seek the benefit of others rather than yourself. Without that mark of sacrificial love, things crumble. They fall apart. That's why Paul was an effect, that's why Paul had an effective ministry. It wasn't about him. It wasn't about what he wanted. It was about what others needed and it was about what God wanted. So again, the application is this. We must consistently choose what is best for other people rather for, than for ourselves. Notice number two this morning, the sin of selfishness. So again, the standard is sacrificial love, but the problem is we have the sin of selfishness within us. 
Now, the sad reality is we're talking about something this morning and people are looking at me like I'm speaking a foreign language. Why? Because we, we don't know what sacrificial love looks like. For many of us sitting in this room, we've never seen sacrificial love displayed before us. When we think about a dad sacrificially loving his wife, many of us, I never saw that. My parents split up. or I never seen that. My parents stayed together, but my dad did his own things. He had his own hobbies. He had his own. He never sacrificed for our family. So again, Paul displays for us something that's, that's foreign. But this pattern that is before us is biblical. We don't know how to give up things. We don't know how to give up people for a greater cause. We don't know what sacrificial love looks like. Our tendency is not to seek others' best interests. Our tendency is to hold on to things and people for our benefit. We always look out for self. We put our interests first. We make decisions based on our good and our benefit instead of the benefit of other people and for their good. The world teaches us that we, the world teaches us to think about ourselves and our needs. What do you want? What would make you happy? But friend, that's hogwash and that's foolishness. Today, they're, they're producing book after book after book. The print press is just continuing on. There's books that we find, you walk into Barnes & Noble or any of these stores, and you read these titles about self-preservation. If you want to love other people, you need to take care of yourself first. But friend, listen to me. That's unbiblical. You seek the interests of other people before yourself. We die to self. When we hold on to things and on to people, we're not living in light of the gospel. So what do we do? If if Christ has paved the way, if if we have a pattern in Paul of sacrificial living, and we've never, we, we need to understand there's a heart issue going on. We're not at the center of the world. It's life's not about us. And we need to understand that. You may have showed up this morning thinking that today's about you, but it's not. It's about Christ. That's why we have a worship service. It's not to entertain ourselves. It's about Him. He's the only one that deserves the glory and the praise. He's the reason why we showed up this morning. See, we're tempted to be obsessive, manipulative, controlling. We like to manipulate people and things and decisions for our best interest, but it's wrong. Philippians 2, verse number 21 says this, For they all seek their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. We have a desperate sickness, every one of us, including myself, and it's the sin of selfishness, the sin of possessiveness. Every one of us have been bitten by the sin of selfishness. And because we've been bitten by this sickness... What it's doing is selfishness is ruining things. It's ruining marriages. There's so many people, and maybe people that's even watching online, that their marriage is failing. They're ready to sign the divorce papers. Why? Because it's selfishness. That's all it is. They're seeking what they want. Well, the Lord wouldn't put me in this situation. The Lord wouldn't let me live. It's selfishness. The reason why many churches is ruined is because of selfishness. People want their way and they won't bend their knee or submit to the Lord or, or even to church leadership because it's selfishness. We go on and we think about these things and we think about how not only churches, marriages and, and relationships, relationships with children, relationships within the workplace, relationships with our neighbors are ruined because of selfishness. That's why the Apostle Paul says, especially about marriage, in Ephesians chapter 5, verse number 25, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church, who gave himself up. That's the pattern for us. Giving up what we want. Giving up our desires in order to serve someone. It's only in those moments that we can truly see growth in relationships. So Paul has painted a picture of sacrifice in this passage. He's giving up. He's sinning. 
because he wants to see growth. There's a lot of people that say, okay, Brother Travis, Paul's set a pattern before us. Cross has set a pattern of sacrificial love. But I've never been set, nobody ever set a pattern for me of what sacrificial love looks like. I didn't have a dad that would do that. I don't have a husband that does that. And so they, they just kind of rot it off and they kind of justify. But here in Scripture, this is enough. Paul has a pattern of sacrificial love. Christ has a pattern, and that's enough. So again, Paul found joy in serving other people. Not in serving himself, but by sacrificing and sending Timothy for the benefit of others. Listen to this. There's a man by the name of G.K. Chester, uh, Chesterton. He once said this, How much larger your life would be if yourself could become smaller in it. Self-denial is a biblical example of love. Love isn't, love isn't selfish. Love doesn't seek its own interests. Love seeks the interests of other people. So here's the struggle. People hear this sermon, they say, okay, yeah, I understand, I need to be more sacrificial. But whenever they go to serve, whenever they go to give, they serve with a tight fist, begrudgingly. That's not true service, that's not true love. Well, here you go, here's your flowers for Valentine's Day. I encourage you to try that and see what happens. Or here, here's your Valentine's. You always ask for it, here's your meal. You say, I never do the laundry, well, here you go. You say, I never teach the kids, well, here. That's not, that's not true sacrificial love. True sacrificial love gives with an open hand, not a closed fist. So what happens? So let's just paint a picture for just a second. What happens if someone hears this passage and they see the example of Paul and Christ, of sacrificial living, but they say, I'm okay. Like, we're getting by. Our marriage is okay. I'm, we're getting by in our family. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm getting by. What happens if we reject sacrificial love? Where will we end up? What happens to the selfish man or woman that doesn't give of themselves, that con constantly seeks their best interest? Well, let's think about this for a second. If a person doesn't sacrificially give and sacrificially love, they're going to dry up. There's no life. There's no spiritual life. There's no spiritual fruit in their life. If you continue the pattern, what's going to happen to your marriage? It's going to dry up. You're going to end up as a statistic of the church. Relationships drop when you don't sacrificially give. You're going to end up getting everything you thought you wanted, and yet you're going to still have no joy. There's a guy I graduated high school with, and shortly after high school, we took very different roads. I mean, just very different roads. And he began this process of accumulation. He thought that all of these toys, all these possessions would somehow fulfill the void that only Christ could have filled in his life. And so over time, you know, uh, after high school, he got a job, he worked, uh, he bought a house. And he said, you know, after I fix up this house, then I'll get married. But he just kept accumulating. He drives the nicest truck that money can buy. He, he fixed up this house, he added on to it. He's, again, he's building his kingdom. Love of self, he's, he's constantly... And so relationship would come into his life, sweet girl, but he never would sacrificially love her. She had enough, she moves on. Second girl enters his life. He never sacrificially, and so it's just this constant pattern. And yet he's still accumulating, he's still building his kingdom even to this day, and yet there is no joy in his life. Well, let's take that guy as an example. What if he saw Christ call to discipleship? What if he surrendered his heart to Christ? What if he, he started saying, you know, life's not about the abundance of possessions. Life's about being on mission. Do you, do you think he would be fulfilled? Do you think he would find joy? Absolutely. Many of you in this room, that was a testimony of your life. It was all about you, what you could get as much as you can, while you can, and then you can the rest for yourself for later. You can have everything that this world has to offer. 
all the pride, all the possessions, all the position, and yet still lack joy and still be void. Sacrificial love is the adjuvant for, gro- for growing selfishness. Does anybody know what a adjuvant is? Some of the farmers might. What's an adjuvant? Or, or maybe you're in the medical field. An adjuvant is something that helps kill cancer. It, it, it makes it hotter. Um, it makes the medicine stronger. Sacrificial love in your life will kill selfishness. You want to you get rid of that selfishness? Then you must sacrificially love. But here's the question. This is number three. The source of sacrificial living. It's very possible that you showed up this morning or you tuned in online and you say, Bro, Travis, you're, I'm living a selfish life. Guilty. Like, if I'm completely honest. So let's ask the question. If we know there's a problem, if we know that there's a sickness within our heart of selfishness, it's always ha- it always has to be about us. Let's ask the question, well, how did Paul live like this? How did Paul live sacrificial? What's the solution, the remedy for our cancer and our sin? Where did, where did Paul get the power to live sacrificially? When we look at Paul's example here in this passage of sacrificial love, that's not natural. People don't naturally love sacrificially. The natural man does not do that. So what is a man's natural reaction? Left to our own devices, how do we react? What will happen if a man does not fight the sin of selfishness in his life? What happens? The Bible tells us what man's natural reaction is. Sin. You don't, you don't fight selfishness in your life, you're going to sin. You don't fight selfishness, you're going to become prideful. You're going to want everybody to look at you and what you've done, what you've accomplished. You don't fight selfishness, you're going to be an idolater. You're going, to, you're going to take other things and place them into the position where only God deserves. You're going to fill the time that God deserves with other things. You don't fight selfishness, that's what's going to happen in your life. You don't fight selfishness, there's going to be strife. There's going to, you think about a marriage that's marked by selfishness. There's always strife. There's always conflict. There's never peace in the home. You don't fight sin, then that's what you have to look forward to. You don't fight sin, your life's going to be marked by jealousy. You're always going to look at what other people have and think about what you don't. A natural man's reaction is fits of anger. You're not going to be calm, cool, and collected. You're going to fly off the handle when things don't go your way. Rivalries. You're going to be competing all the time with your spouse. Well, I've done this, you haven't dissensions, divisions, all these things don't only happen within a marriage, but within a church, within every relationship, the selfishness is present. A sacrificial life, what we're talking about, this standard we're talking about this morning, it's not natural. It's supernatural. Paul gives us the source of sacrificial love. You want to be sacrificial in your love? Then look at the Bible. Let's see where it comes from. 1 Thessalonians chapter number 3, verse number 11. The Bible says this, Now may our God and Father Himself and our Lord Jesus direct our way to you. Now listen to this. This is the source. And may the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another. So where is the source of love? Where does love come from? Well, the Bible tells us that God is love. If you have no relationship with God, you cannot love. Do you understand unbelievers cannot love? It's just this facade. It's not really loving. It's all selfishness. They're just, they're just saying the right things. They're just doing the right things in order to seek pleasure for themselves. Only a true born-again believer can experience love and can extend love to anyone else. So let's keep going here. What was it that caused the Apostle Paul to love the Thessalonians? It was love that God had placed in his heart. The Spirit... The Holy Spirit, that's what happens when you get saved. Christ comes inside of your your life. He gives you a new heart. He gives you new desires. What made the Apostle Paul want to love this church? The Holy Spirit inside of him gave that desire. 
There's no way you can love your spouse. There's no way that you can love other people. There's no way you can properly love your children without a relationship with Jesus Christ. It's just not even possible. You don't even want to. The Spirit gave Paul the desire to love and the power to live a sacrificial life. The only way that you can give up your desires is by surrender, by repentance, by turning to Christ. Paul was able to live a sacrificial life because God's Son had lived a sacrificial life. In John, in the third chapter, in verse number 16, the Bible says this, For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son that whoever believes in Him would not perish but experience eternal life. Paul's sacrifice, the way Paul was able to love sacrificially was rooted in and it flowed from the love that had been shown and the grace had been shown to him. You can love faithfully your spouse. You can love faithfully your family. You can love faithfully the members of this church in and through thinking about and meditating on and treasuring the truth that God has loved you. That's what pushes and that's what drives our sacrificial love. Paul's example here this morning is our example. What we're called to do is exactly what the Apostle Paul was called to do. Listen to this. Luke chapter 9, we're almost done. Verse number 23 says this. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Loving your spouse should not just happen on Valentine's Day. Loving Anybody should be a daily effort. Listen to this. Let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? I want to speak just very quickly to those that are here, who, or even maybe listening online, who are unbelievers. What I mean by that is there's never been a moment in your life where you've turned to Christ. You, if I come to you after church and said, hey, such and such, when were you saved? I'm not asking when you were baptized. I mean, the moment that you said, Lord, I need help. There's no way I can do this on my own. I've tried. And I continue to fail. I need help. So if I was to come to you after church, would you be able to give me that date? That time when Christ saved you? If you're not, then, then listen to me. All that we've been talking about this morning about sacrificial love, it's not possible for you until you cry out to the Lord in faith. There's no way that you can love someone sacrificially until you work out the relationship between you and the Lord. There has to be. John chapter 3, a man came to Christ and said, Lord, what must I do to be saved? Jesus told Nicodemus, he said, you've got to be born again. Now, wait a second. How am I born a second time? What Jesus was saying is there had to be a spiritual birthday in this man's life. So he was, he was physically born, but there's also a moment in his life where he was spiritually born. A moment that God took out that old heart and placed in a new one with new desire. Guys, listen, if that's never happened in your life, if there's never been a change, if there's never been repentance, you're headed towards this, towards sin and self and destruction, enslavement. If there's never been a moment where you've cried out to the Lord and said, Lord, help me. This is where I'm headed and this is the end, but I want to go in the opposite way. If you've never done that, that means you're lost. If you Listen to me. Every single person here this morning will make a decision. Everybody's going to leave. You're going to leave either out of that door or this door. But you're also going to make a decision whenever it comes to Jesus Christ. You're either going to accept that free gift of salvation and you're going to turn from sin and destruction and turn to Christ, or you're not. You're going to make a decision this morning. So believer, the ball's in your court. What will you decide? Will you cry out to the Lord in faith or will you just, will you just reject Him? Because the end is hell and eternal destruction. But now I want to speak to the believer here this morning. Who, who is pursuing the Lord, but uh, this morning was just a good reminder. Life's not about me. So what is it, 
what can we do? How can we follow this biblical example here this morning? How can I live out sacrificial love practically here this morning? Number one, we're called to live. I want to speak to the men first. We're called to live sacrificially for our wives. Are we doing that? In every area of our marriage, are, are we really being sacrificial? Are we eliminating the distractions in our life in order to serve them? Are we turning off the TV in order to actually have a conversation with them? Dying to self. I know, I know a lot of guys don't want to talk, and that's fine. But it doesn't matter what we want. We're called to serve sacrificially as Christ loved the church. Are you intentionally dating your wife? Wow, that's a big one, right? Are you making plans to date and pursue your wife? Like before you got married. That's one way that we can sacrificially love our wives. What about our children? Are we sacrificially serving our children? Do we put time and effort into training them in godliness? Or is that just something that is just a leftover? Hey, if there's enough time left over at the end of the day, then I'll train them. How else can we sacrifice for our children? We can sacrifice the time that we have to ourselves and use that time to prepare or to spend with our children. We can sacrifice our sleep. Some of you guys are in that stage or you're heading into that stage. To be sacrificial to your children, you may have to give up sleep. And you will. <laughs> They'll remind you. How can we sacrificially love our families? Pride. We've got to deal with pride. When we mess up, we confess that sin to our family. That's sacrificing, right? We can... We can refocus the, the financial money that we spend on ourselves, on, on our hobbies. We can refocus that money towards what? Towards serving our families. What about our churches? How can we sacrificially serve within the church? You know, every one of us in this room, if you just raise your hand this morning. If you've turned from sin and self and you are a believer in Jesus Christ, just slip up your hand. All right, so there's a lot of people in here. But the thing is, Every one of us have different spiritual gifts. But they're all plugged into the same power source, the Holy Spirit. God gives each believer. When you were born again, you were given a gift. And you're called to serve with that gift. Your gift is meant to build up Raymond Baptist Church. My gift is meant to build up the church. So how can you sacrificially um, work? How can you sacrificially love the church? Exercise your spiritual gift. What happens if you don't exercise? You get fat, right? Same is true spiritually. You're not as lean. You're not able to, you're not able to be used like you once were. Use your gift. Some of it, you, it may just be practically working. You're just good at working. The Lord has given you that gift. You just know how things work. So maybe your spiritual gift is just coming out before the service on Sunday and salt in the parking lot. Wait, now that doesn't sound very spiritual, but it's your gift. What about checking for updates with our widows? Maybe you're, the Lord's placed you in a position. or Think about all that's happened these past few weeks or this past year. Like, How often have I sacrificially loved the church by caring for our widows? I'm not, I'm not just talking towards the deacons. I'm talking about every believer. Are we checking on people? When was the last time you come to your deacons or your pastor and say, hey, I'm, I just really want to serve. I just, I just want to find an area which nobody else is really doing anything. I just want to serve according to my gift. Or are we just kind of plagued by selfishness and apathy? We just really don't care. It's sin. How can we sacrificially serve our neighbors? Okay, winter's coming. I mean, it's here. Have you checked on your neighbors? Like, are they okay? Are they still living? You can sacrificially love your neighbors. Cook them a meal. Sit with them on the porch. We'll wait till spring on that one. But Why do we do all this? It's to demonstrate the love of Christ that's been shown to us, the mercy that's been shown to us. 
When we choose to sacrifice our own joy and our own comfort, we're doing something that's not natural. The world doesn't do that. This is something supernatural. So when people see you sacrificially serving your spouse or your wife or your church or your, your children or your neighbor, your boss, they notice, hey, this isn't natural. Why is this guy doing this? Why is this woman loving her husband like then we are witnesses to this love that's been shown to us. I want to ask you two questions, and we're going to be done. Friend, are you imitating Paul's pattern as he imitates Christ's pattern? Sacrificial love. Are you demonstrating God's love to those around you? Guys, listen, you're an unbeliever here this morning. Now's the time to settle the matter. You're going to make a decision this morning. And here in a second, Micah's is going to come forward. You guys know this. And this is the time in which I want to invite you to come forward. I would, I, I, would, I would encourage you to come forward. I want to share with you what God's Word says about how, you, how you're saved. It's simple. It's free. But it's an invitation. I can't make you take that invitation. You have to accept it. I want to pray for us and then Micah's heading up here. Lord, for those that are here this morning who's never seen sacrificial love in action, I pray that they would trust your word. Lord, help them to see the example of this caring pastor who loved this church enough to sacrifice for it. Lord, I also pray for uh, the one that is here this morning that just really doesn't know. Like They're sitting here right now, and, and Lord, you're, you're convicting their hearts. They know something is different. They know that you're calling them to make a change. Lord, I pray that you would give them grace, and Lord, through the power of your Holy Spirit, you would overwhelm them into making a decision this morning. Help them to understand that if they continue their life without you, or even in rebellion to you, it will end in destruction. There will be pain, there will be sorrow, there will not be any joy. Lord, please help us this morning as we respond to you in faith. And, and Lord, I know. Lord, I do trust you. I know you're working in hearts. I know you can use a messed up, feeble man such as myself. And through your word, you can do something supernatural. So, Lord, I do ask this morning that you would work in our hearts. Call us back to yourself and save those who are lost. Lord, we know you will. And we'll give you the glory for it. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.